today to um, introduce my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Paul, who will be giving us a, um, a talk about the circadian basis of sleep disorders. Um, Dr. Paul did his um, undergraduate degree at Howard um, University and then um, his graduate degree at um, Georgia State University, where we first um, ran into each other um, and, and got to know each other at that point. Um, he went on to do a postdoctoral um, training at Northwestern University and took his first job at Morehouse University. And I, you could see that um, you know, he's been associated then with two gems of the historically um, black college and university system between Howard and um, Morehouse. And so we were really lucky, I guess, about six years ago to attract him here to UCLA, um, where he um, has a joint appointment um, in psychiatry, as well as a, um, let's see, in, what is the integrative um, biology? Integrative biology and physiology. Yeah, right. thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I consider him one of ours. Um, you know, and, and his lab space is in, in the semel here and has really been, um, in, in my mind, an integral hire because um, really the work that um, Dr. Paul and his team are doing fits in so much with one of the emphasis in psychiatry, which is we're trying to develop a research program focusing on the circadian and sleep disorders associated with psychiatric um, diseases. And so Dr. Paul has really been critical in, in, in this and in the development of the system and we're still we're still growing, um, but but we have a really nice group now. And I think for um, all of you can appreciate that both the dysfunctions associated with sleep and circadian rhythms are a critical part of essentially all psychiatric disorders. But but in addition to that, and one thing that I've tried to keep you know emphasizing is that this may be a modifiable factor, something that we, we know how to improve. Um, circadian rhythms and and sleep in, in many individuals. And so it's, it really represents a um, unusual opportunity for us to um, potentially intervene early and alter the trajectory of diseases that we don't have a lot of other treatments for. So um, with that, I'm really excited to um, hear the, the latest research from Dr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the kind introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Cole, who I, I, I did meet as a graduate student. So it's, it was a, a real, real honor to be able to join him here at UCLA um, after you know knowing him, so, meeting him so early in my career, and him being one of the people that helped steward me um, to this point. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the circadian basis of sleep disorders. I hope everyone can see me and hear me, hear me clearly, um, both in the room and on Zoom. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of my work, some past work, and some work going on right now, but that's going to be the second half of my talk. For the first half of my talk, I'm going to frame um, the importance of the work I do as it pertains to uh, circadian rhythm sleep disorders. Um, so that's a lot, so I'm going to be moving relatively quickly. Uh, so let's get jump right into it. Um, sleep is regulated by two processes. The processes that are on the slide in front of you, the circadian rhythms, and sleep homeostasis, both of which I'll expand on in a few slides in the talk. And this is a model that is, and I, and I will uh, expand on, on the model, the two process model, which defines how both of these processes regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Um, and the human sleep-wake cycle, which these processes regulate, is familiar to many of us because we live it every day. Uh, and some of us here in, in in, uh, in Geffen and in the Department of Psychiatry study and treat, treat patients that have sleep-wake disorders. Um, if you don't have a substantial disorder problem uh, sleeping, your sleep cycle is usually between 90 and 110 minutes and each cycle is repeated six, three to six times per night. What's the sleep cycle? The sleep cycle is defined after um, a, a stage of non-rapid eye movement sleep followed by rapid eye movement sleep. Um, non-rapid eye movement sleep is uh, its descriptor, um, kind of a, describes what it is. It's, it's a stage of sleep where you spend most of your sleep at nighttime. You're, uh, you do not have rapid eye movements under your eyelids and, and there's usually no dreaming in this state and you have sustained muscle tone. REM sleep, um, is defined by rapid movement of the eyes under the eyelids and where most of your dreaming occurs during REM sleep. And you have relatively limp muscles. And in clinical settings, we typically measure sleep using EEG, EMG. There's also a video has becoming more popular, which enables uh, clinicians to 
uh, uh, com compose a hypnogram, which kind of shows what we call sleep-wake architecture, really your sleep-wake patterns through the night. And I often talk about the sleep-wake cycle. You're going to hear me talk a lot about wakefulness because when we study sleep, we recognize that wakefulness is as important to sleep as sleep is. Um, but what is, is it that regulates this human sleep cycle? What is it that generates it and what's responsible for maintaining healthy amounts of sleep in a healthy sleep-wake architecture? Again, the two-process model, which I showed you in the first slide, was proposed by Alexander Borbet in 1982 at the University of Zurich. And he proposed, again, the sleep is regulated by these two processes, the circadian rhythms and sleep homeostasis. And he even diagrammed the ways in which these processes interact. The sleep homeostat is a process determined by prior sleep and prior wakefulness. It's a process by which you have sleep pressure that builds up during wakefulness and dissipates during sleep. Um, sleep pressure is known by a lot of different terms, but it all refers to the same thing. Process S is what Bourbet first called it in 1982. Um, it's a process that, again, that builds during wakefulness, uh, decreases during sleep. We call it sleep pressure, sleep propensity, sleep need, you may have heard, sleep drive, sleep debt is a popular uh, uh, term to refer to process S. They all refer to the same thing. And it's a real homeostat. It's a set point that is actively defended if you move too far away from it. We have a certain amount of sleep per night that your body operates best um, uh, under. And if you go too far less or too far greater than that, your body activates mechanisms to put you back there. Um, the circadian process is a real clock, which I'll go into in a few slides. The circadian process times the time of the day where you're most likely to go to sleep and most likely to wake up. A less appreciated uh, role of the circadian clock is it's responsible for consolidating your sleep states into uh, uh, biphasic states for most of us. Some of us have more than biphasic states, but generally speaking, we're sleeping at nighttime and we're awake during the day. That consolidation is generated by the clocks in your body. If there are no clocks in your body, then your sleep is not as consolidated and, and is more fragmented throughout the day. And then there's this ultradian rhythm that's responsible for the sleep cycle that I talked about in the prior slide, this 90 minute cycle that occurs during um, throughout the, the night, about three to six times. And it's, 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 an, it's a process, but it's not necessarily independent. Um, under Bourbet's model, this ultradian process is driven by the interaction of these two processes. And as I said, if you don't have a circadian uh, clock, your sleep becomes more fragmented throughout the, the night and kind of breaking down this process. Also, if you uh, challenge the uh, sleep homeostat, we call it the homeostat, by not sleeping, it also interferes with this process, uh, this the ultradian process. So as a result, we tend to think of the ultradian rhythms as a manifestation of the interactions of the homeostatic process and the circadian process, keeping the two process model nice and neat. And I'm gonna go through both processes in the order that they are in this slide. First, I wanna talk about the sleep homeostat. That's your drive for sleep. Bourbet called it process S. We call it sleep drive, sleep debt. I tend to call it sleep pressure. The figure here shows one of the reasons I like the pressure because it, it's kind of like uh, the pressure in the pipe, right? When you're asleep, that pressure is relieved and the pipe is flowing. When you wake up, you close that pipe. And that pressure builds. The pressure builds as you're awake um, tonically. And then when it's time to sleep, you open the pipe again and that pressure is relieved. What's responsible for opening and closing the pipe? The circadian clock. The circadian clock is responsible for dictating the times of the day you're, you're most likely to go to sleep and the times of the day you're most likely to wake up. So the circadian clock uh, closes the pipe when you wake up in the morning, that pressure builds, builds, builds. When it opens the pipe at night, that pressure is already high and you're more likely to go to sleep uh, pretty fast. Um, and we normally measure sleep pressure in EEG, in the bandwidths of EEG. We call it delta power or slow wave activity. And that's important because I'm gonna use that term throughout the presentation. And slow wave activity and non rem delta power are our gold standard for measuring process S. Um, sleep drive is really the only really reliable standard that we have to date. And the neurobiological substrates for process S or the homeostatic drive for sleep are unknown. Circadian driven rhythms are driven by clocks, real clocks. You know, a clock has to be able to keep time accurately. And that's what the circadian clock in the body does. It keeps time accurately. Also, a clock needs to be able to be set and synchronized with the external environment. This clocks in the body are, is able to be set primarily by the daily light dark cycle, but there are also environmental cues that can, that can uh, synchronize circadian rhythms also, such as food availability. And then you have to be able to tell the time. If you have a clock that you can set and keeps 
accurate time, but you can't tell what time it is, that clock's no good, right? In this uh, picture, you look at the hands on the clock. Our circadian rhythms are expressed by a variety of different behavioral and physiological rhythms. One of the most obvious is the one I'm talking to you about today, the sleep-wake cycle, right? Uh, you can tell the rhythm of your circadian clock by the rhythms of your sleep-wake cycle. If you're in a constant environment, if you're in a 24-hour day-night environment, you're gonna wake up and sleep every 24 hours. But if you're in a constant environment, that time is gonna be either slightly shorter or slightly longer than 24 hours, but it will stay accurate. The circadian clock's accurate. When I was young, clocks were, uh, were, were driven by gears. These days, most of the clocks are driven by, um, uh, by uh, electronic devices. But essentially, there's a timing mechanism that keeps accurate time. The clocks in your body are no different. The clocks in your body are driven by a timing mechanism that consists of a molecular feedback loop of all of the genes on the slide in front of you. For time's sake, I'm not gonna go over all of the individual components of this clock, all of the individual genes. Suffice to say that the majority of these genes, this clock is very redundant and um, it has to keep time in a variety of different environments. It's one of the few processes in the body that's not temperature sensitive. So you can put this clock in a variety of different temperatures, high or low, and it still keeps accurate time. As a result, the clock is, has a, a tremendous amount of redundancy built into it. So most of these genes on this slide can be, if you lose a gene or if you have an alteration of a gene, uh, there's another gene that can take the place of that gene. Um, uh, and the gene we're interested in in my lab is BMO1. I'm gonna get into that in a few slides a little later. I think I'm gonna show this cartoon a little later. But the transcription of these genes into mRNA and the translation of the mRNA and the proteins these are all transcription. The majority of these genes here, the majority are transcription factors, which come back into the nucleus and act on other genes, either as regulators or repressors. And this entire loop, it's a loop, just like the gears of a clock, has a time constant on it. And that time constant determines the frequency of the period of your endogenous circadian rhythm. Um, each of these genes also, through cellular process, can be manipulated by external environment. Not each of them, but some of them, which allows the external environment to shift and synchronize your circadian clocks. So it's a very robust and ro reliable system. If the clock breaks down, or if the clock is perturbed in some form or fashion, it can result in circadian rhythm sleep disorders. And circadian rhythm sleep disorders are dis defined by the inability to synchronize one circadian sleep-wake pattern with the sleep-wake schedule of surrounding environment. And it causes a variety of negative sleep uh, phenotypes of sleep consequences, insomnia being one of them, excessive daytime sleeping is gonna occur. And it's also, these circadian rhythm sleep disorders also tend to be comorbid with neurodevelopmental, psychiatric, and neurodegenerative disorders. They're autism spectrum disorders, autism uh, spectrum disorders, and uh, a variety of mental illnesses that are associated or comorbid with circadian rhythm sleep disorders. So they, 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 um, they can underlie a lot of other problems and they can also be caused by a lot of other um, somatic problems. This is a list of several of the circadian rhythm sleep disorders. The third tends to be the one most people are most familiar with, jet lag. If, if you're flying across time zones, oftentimes it's difficult for you to adjust to the new time zone, zone and oftentimes that's most reflected in your sleep-wake patterns, your inability to go to sleep or you're falling asleep at times where you're not normally um, falling asleep as a result of jet lag. It is a circadian rhythm sleep disorders. The shift work disorder, those of us who are rotating non-standard shifts or rotate, working non-standard shifts or rotating shifts oftentimes tend to have sleep-wake disorders. And remember, um, for shift work disorder, if you're doing this on a long period of time, then again, these, these, shift, these uh, circadian-based sleep disorders can become comorbid with a lot of other conditions and shift work sleep disorder um, when extended over long periods of time have been associated with higher risk for chronic illnesses. And then there's advanced sleep phase and delayed sleep phase disorder, the two at the top. These are or disorders that um, uh, make it difficult for you to synchronize your sleep-wake cycle with normal societal times or with times that, that we normally associate with sleep awakefulness. Um, advanced sleep phase syndrome means your wake or sleep times are more likely to be a lot earlier than what we consider in the normal sleep range. And delayed sleep phase syndrome, we call it disorder now. You can see the slide's a little old. Delayed sleep phase syndrome um, is usually associated with an inability to have sleep wake times. Your sleep wake times tend to be delayed um, a lot later than societal norms. Now, we should be taking for granted that even though these, we should not take for granted that even though these sleep-wake disorders make it really difficult for you to
to function, um, and especially when it comes to cognitive uh, uh, responses to the environment, if you're sleeping at the wrong times of day and you're awake um, at times of day when you're not normally uh, used to being awake, it can have, um, it can be reflective of cognitive impairments. But as I said in the previous slides, both of these disorders tend to be comorbid with a variety of other disorders. So I've worked with groups and organizations that have people that are afflicted with these disorders and they tend to be, they, they are, they're, they're not pretty. Uh, people who have suffered these disorders often have a variety of other somatic illnesses or, or disease states that are associated with the disorder that makes it very, very difficult um, for them to, uh, to function in society, not just because they're sleeping and, and being awake at different times of the day, but it also creates a lot of other debilitating um, associated uh, uh, symptoms, it makes it difficult to hold a job, it makes it difficult to take care of children, a variety of other things. So these, these uh, circadian rhythm disorders can um, be, be reflected in, in, in a way that, are, that makes it difficult for, for patients suffering from these disorders to live, a, to, to live a fruitful life. And more recently, for those two specific disorders, advanced sleep phase and delayed sleep phase syndrome, um, several labs have found that, that several varieties of these disorders are genetic in nature and driven by polymorphisms or mutants of circadian genes. So circadian genes were discovered um, first in the fruit fly, but then in mammals throughout the last few decades. And in recent years, we found out that polymorphisms of these genes underlie actual sleep-wake disorders, right? If you have a, a, an allele or, uh, or a polymorphism in circadian genes like period two, any of the period ones, period one, two, or three, um, or casein kinase epsilon, which is responsible for phosphorylating several of these clock genes. The period genes are genes that, that were in the slide of the molecular clock that I showed you. They're core components of the molecular clock. They're gears of the circadian clock. And if those genes have mutations in them, they can be responsible for generating or, create, or underlying these illnesses that I talked to you about. So circadian-based sleep disorders um, can be driven genetically. And we know some of the, the underlying genes that are responsible for them. Um, also, what has come to light over the past few years because of, of, of the advanced tools we now have available to us, are that polymorphism circadian genes are not just responsible for cir some circadian-based sleep disorders, but also responsible for phenotypic heterogeneity in daily sleep amount. And I want to go over some of the examples of that that have come about recently. Um, clock gene mutation, whoops. Uh, have a, I should say, clock gene mutation, some of the ones that I showed you in the previous slide that are responsible for circadian-based sleep disorders, also have a variety of effects of, on sleep and wakefulness that may not be related to sleep disorders. In 2007, um, uh, in a lab run by uh, Dirk Jan Dyke at the University of Surrey, found that the period gene, uh, period, three muta uh, poly period three circadian gene a polymorphism in that gene is responsible for regulating daily sleep-wake amounts. This was a landmark paper because until now we had, there was always a question as to whether the daily amount of sleep that, you, that you're naturally gonna sleep, that you're gonna spontaneously sleep in absence of alarm clocks has a genetic basis. And this paper was one of the landmark papers that showed that not only is there a genetic basis for the daily amount that, uh, that you sleep at night, but that it's a circadian gene, a gene that is regulating the clock. And this also uh, kind of begins to question Borbet's original two process model that had the uh, circadian timing system and the homeostatic timing system as completely separate and discrete mechanisms. This shows that um, the, the figures on the right without belaboring too much shows that this mutation had the uh, effect on the ability to recover from sleep, which is what RN means, which is recovering non-REM sleep. Um, or recovery, not non-REM, because that's a REM sleep time. Recovery, I can't remember what the N stands for, but the, the, on the left is baseline, on the right is recovery, showing that this mutation did have an effect on sleep-wake homeostasis. Um, again, suggesting that circadian-based uh, factors may also play a role in the ability to recover from sleep loss. Another uh, paper done by a group at University of uh, California, San Francisco, led by Ying Wei Fu, found that the circadian gene DEC2 had the same effect, that there's a variance of DEC2 that can control the daily amounts of non-REM and REM sleep. Um, that group at the University of California, San Francisco, Ying Wei Fu and, uh, and Louis Tachek 
have actually done uh, and published a series of uh, genome-wide association studies finding a variety of genes that are uh, associated with daily amount of sleep uh, per day. And many of those genes are circadian timing genes, again, suggesting that uh, circadian genes that are associated with circadian clock may do double duty playing um, part of the circadian timing system and also acting as components of the sleep homeostat, the homeostatic ability to recover from sleep loss. And those are the two uh, studies at, at the top of the slide. The study at the bottom of the slide was a study led by Till Ronenberg at uh, University of Munich, um, showing that variants of the gene clock. Yes, if you paid attention to the uh, molecular slide I had, one of the genes is called clock. That actually stands for something, uh, circadian locomotor output cycles, kaput as uh, named by Martha Vita Turner at Northwestern University. Circadian locomotor output cycles kaput, that's the gene that regulates the circadian clock. And uh, Teal's group found that variants of that clock are associated with sleep duration in two independent populations. So that began my lab asking questions about the association between circadian timing components and the ability to recover from sleep loss. My lab is really interested in the ability to recover from sleep loss. As I showed in earlier slides, if that system breaks down, it can be responsible for sleep wake disorders and a variety of, of other disorders um, too. I should also point out something I didn't say on the sleep homeostasis slide, that there's a flip side to that coin, right? There's, if your homeostat breaks down, then you're gonna be more susceptible to sleep wake disorders. However, when you lose sleep, there are acute consequences and chronic consequences. Most of the acute consequences we have, that means you're losing sleep for just one day or for shorter periods of time. We tend to think of cognitive breakdown and cognitive dysfunction, memory impairments, inability to focus on things, which we tend to lump under the umbrella of, of executive function, right? Um, you get that after one night of sleep loss. Uh, but then if you have repeated sleep loss night after night after night, because you're working rotating shifts or because you have circadian-based sleep disorder, then that increases your risk for a variety of illnesses. It increases your risk for chronic illnesses such as type two diabetes and other metabolic impairments. It increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and also for stroke cerebrovascular disease. Repeated sleep loss also has negative effects on your immune system. So it increases your risk for infectious diseases. So these are chronic effects of sleep loss over time that really break down the body and increase uh, morbidity and, and the risk of mortality. Something about getting sleep in people that don't have sleep restores cognitive processes in the short term and protects your health in the long term. And that's one of the reasons that we're so interested in sleep homeostasis to try to understand what are the biological and neurobiological substrates that underlie sleep homeostasis so we can begin to have better treatments for some of the illnesses, so some of the uh, acute and chronic um, uh, 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 consequences associated with circadian-based sleep disorders. All right, uh, polymorphism, I uh, showed you guys that in the slide earlier, the last two slides, the polymorphism of circadian genes are responsible for phenotypic heterogeneity in daily sleep amount. So in my lab, we went back to see how can we learn more about this, this, this kind of weird association that uh, came to be revealed over the last decade or so um, that the circadian timing genes may underlie sleep-wake disorders and may underlie the ability to recover from sleep loss. And when I first set my lab up in Morehouse School of Medicine, which is before I came here, I set my lab up in 2006. I was hired in 2006, the year this cartoon was uh, drawn by Caroline Cohen, Joe Takahashi, and also the year that that group began to learn more about BMOL1, brain muscle aren't like factor. That same year, they published a paper which showed that BMOL1 was both necessary and sufficient for circadian timing. So the, every other gene on this slide, if you get rid of it, if you delete it, the clock will still function. It may not function ideally, but it will still work because the majority of these genes can be compensated for by other genes. Every gene actually with, uh, on this slide, uh, uh, the cryptochromes, can, the cries can, can substitute for the periods. If you knock out clock, and pass 2 could substitute for that. Um, uh, Joe Takahashi's lab in 2006 showed that BMO1 was the only gene in this uh, feedback loop that's both necessary and sufficient for circadian function. If you get rid of it, you break the clock, the clock does not work. And if you look at, uh, and, and, and the variety of processes that are regulated by the clock no longer work. So we were interested in this gene because it is, at the time we began the studies, what we felt was the clock gene. 
Also, when you're a young assistant professor that doesn't have your first grant yet, you don't have a whole lot of money to be doing double and triple knockouts. So one gene, <laughs> targeting one gene kind of helps. At the time when we began that study, a, a study had already been published in 2005 by Aaron Leposky and Fred Turk's lab. I happened to be a postdoc in the lab actually when the study was published. It already looked at how knocking out that one gene alters sleep in mice. And it showed that um, knocking out BMR1 increased baseline sleep amount at the expense of wakefulness and increased slow wave activity. Slow wave activity, as I mentioned earlier, is our best measure of sleep pressure process S. Again, sleep drive, sleep debt, we all call it the same thing, it's the homeostatic mechanism. Slow wave activity measures the power of slow waves in your EEG during REM, non REM sleep. During non REM sleep, um, your slow waves or delta waves are the predominant waveform of EEG. And those slow waves, the power in those waves reflect your sleep pressure. Um, the, the, the longer you've been awake prior to your first episode of non REM sleep, the more power you have in your, in your delta waves. So we tend to use. Um, slow wave activity and del non-REM delta power interchangeably. Both of them mean essentially the same thing. The power in your slow waves or delta waves during non-REM sleep. And it is our best measure of the sleep homeostat, homeostatic pressure. Incidentally, there are several limitations that are kind of going to be important to what I'm talking about to, to you. One of those limitations is you can only measure it during non-REM sleep, right? So it would be great if we could measure sleep pressure reliably and accurately when you're awake because that's when we want to know if, if, if your continued wakefulness is going to um, cause impairments. Um, Dr. Leposky also found out that uh, knocking out BMOL1 gene in mice attenuates the ability to recover from sleep loss. It has robust effects on sleep homeostat. Another example of you know, this phenomenon where genes that underlie the circadian clock may also underlie process S, this home sleep homeostasis, and that those two systems may actually share molecular components. Um, however, clocks are throughout the body. The majority of cells and the majority of tissues in your body have circadian clocks. Now, those clocks are synchronized by that primary clock in the brain. So if you get rid of the clock in the brain, most of these clocks will desynchronize and you look behaviorally like you don't have any rhythms. But it's not that you don't have any rhythms. It's just that the rhythms in all of your tissues aren't speaking to each other anymore. They're kind of fighting with each other because the clock in the brain is not there to, to tell them to get along. And when that happens, they desynchronize, they run at their own specific rhythms, and you look behaviorally arrhythmic. And when Aaron did that knockout, we just did not know if the re resulting sleep phenotypes we saw were being were the result of actual sleep weight mechanisms in the brain being, um, uh, uh, being compromised, or whether the variety of these phenotypes observed in that mouse were responsible for the sleep phenotypes. It's not a healthy mouse. The BMOL1 whole body knockout is, is somewhat sometimes uh, associated with the model, model of accelerated aging. It has phenotypes that are associated with arthritis, like the ones um, listed in front of you. And we just were really curious as to whether this gene actually was, was a component of the, home, the mechanism responsible for sleep homeostasis, or whether the effects on sleep we were seeing were being driven by these kind of ancillary factors. So we uh, asked two questions, are the influences of BMO on sleep being driven by brain specific mechanisms or by the ancillary effects I showed you in the previous slide? And if the influences of BMO one on sleep are related to circadian timing. And at the time we were able to get this mouse model again from Joe Takahashi's lab, the study that showed that this gene was a critical component of circadian rhythms. We were able to, on that knockout mouse that I showed you in the previous slide that had those sleep impairments, um, Joe's group was able to rescue BMOL1 in the skeletal muscle uh, on this, in the slide on the left and in the brain on the slide on the right. Now, why rescue in the brain and the muscle? Why choose those tissues? Well, if you guys remember what I told you BMOL1 is, stands for, it's brain and muscle aren't like factor. And at the time we began these experiments, we knew the BMOL1 was expressed in cells outside of the brain and muscle, but that its expression in brain and muscle was much greater than in other tissues. Um, so we decided to start with those two tissues. Those are the tissues in which the gene shows its mo mo most robust expression and whose knockouts have the, the most negative phenotypes. Just for bookkeeping, if you rescue BMOL1 in the skeletal muscle, the mouse still is behaviorally arrhythmic, has no visible circadian rhythms to speak of, but some of the answer, many of the ancillary phenotypes are relieved. The mouse is generally a bit healthier and lives longer. 
If you rescue BMO1 in the brain of a knockout, the circadian rhythms are restored. The mouse shows robust circadian rhythms, but it's still not a healthy mouse, still uh, uh, shows uh, many of the negative phenotypes I showed during the previous slide and still does not live um, very long. Uh, so we took these mice and we implanted them with EEG for recording of sleep-wake states. EEG is a standard tool for recording sleep. And we placed the mic mice in the 12-hour light, 12-hour dark, spontaneous environment and watched how they slept. And um, our first result was a, was a surprise to us. Again, um, this, these graphs show total amount of non-REM sleep, REM sleep and non-REM slow wave activity over the entire 24-hour period of, of recording of spontaneous sleep-wake states. Again, non-REM slow wave activity is our best measure of process S, but it's the graph on the left I want to draw your attention to. As you can see, rescuing BMO1 in the brain did not make the mice, even though it restored circadian rhythms in the mice, the mice have healthy circadian rhythms, the mice still slept like knockouts, um, did not sleep like wild type. So re even though restoring BMO1 in the brain was sufficient to restore circadian rhythm phenotypes, it was not sufficient to make the mice sleep like wild types. Then we looked at our muscle rescues. Again, rescuing BMO1 in the skeletal muscle um, does not restore circadian rhythms. These mice are still arrhythmic, but many of the ancillary phenotypes are re restored. And we found that uh, rescuing BMO1 in the skeletal muscle was sufficient to make these mice sleep like wild types. A very surprising result to us. Um, and, uh, but we still did not know whether the phenotypes in sleep were driven by sleep regulatory mechanisms or whether these mice just slept better because they just felt better. You know, they could have, could have just been healthier and because they weren't as sick, they could have just been sleeping better. So we did what we call a standard sleep homeostatic challenge, which is something we do in the lab. It's how we test the sleep homeostat, which we know is a brain driven process. After baseline recording, you have people tap the cage of a mouse. You know, uh, the mouse looks like it's gonna fall asleep. You make noise to make the mouse wake up. And then if the mouse gets really sleepy, usually around the fourth and fifth hour, you have to gently prod the mouse. It's really the only reliable way to keep a mouse awake, total sleep deprivation. If we use uh, um, uh, automated measures, sometimes the mouse can fall asleep as I'll show you in a few slides. So you have to be really good at, at uh, attracting talented undergraduates to the lab to be able to stand and tap on cages <laughs> for six hours. And then we measure EEG during uh, the 18 hour recovery period. When you do that, you get a pretty standard response. This is actual data in wild type mice that shows that after six hours of forced wakefulness, uh, as you can see the open circles, the mice usually have a sleep response. It's not huge, um, but it's sufficient to measure. It's a, sleep home it's a standard sleep homeostatic challenge because um, this is the uh, paradigm under which we, uh, you know, our, most of the people who have published show that this is uh, a, uh, a uh, recovery response that's not very heavily influenced by circadian timing. And when we look at sleep homeostasis, that's what we're trying to get. We're trying to look at the pure homeostatic response without really any influence by circadian timing. Obviously, these guys have clocks, so you're never going to escape the influence of the circadian clock. But under this standard homeostatic challenge, this is the best way we currently have to do it. You get slight but measurable increases in non-REM sleep, slight but measurable increases in REM sleep, and this robust increase in non-REM relative delta power, which as I said earlier, is the same as slow wave activity, our best measure of sleep homeostasis in mice and in people. And as I said earlier, you can't measure it during wakefulness under normal circumstances. I'm gonna change, I'm gonna show you something a little different later. So under the forced wakefulness, there is no non-REM delta power because the mice are awake. Um, then once you finish your forced wakefulness during bouts of non-REM sleep, you can measure non-REM uh, delta power. And as you can see, it acts just like process S after extended wakefulness, it's much higher than in wild types. And it dissipates much more quickly under sleep um, because, because the mice are sleeping more, as you can see here, the mice are sleeping more and they're sleeping more deeply after sleep deprivation. If I sleep deprive you and you go back to sleep, you're gonna sleep more deeply. That's reflected in a much more rapid dissipation of process S during sleep than in wild type mice. Uh, so we looked in our mouse models and we found out that the brain rescue mice during the recovery from sleep homeostasis, again, we're looking at slow wave activity here along the vertical axis. That's our best way of measuring uh, sleep homeostasis. 
And when we rescued uh, BMO1 in the brain, these recovery response was similar to knockouts, not similar to wild types. And when we rescued BMO1 in skeletal muscle, these mice, mice recovered like wild types. What this suggested to us is that the mutation was not just, these mice weren't just sleeping better because they were feeling better, that this mutation was actually regulating sleep processes in the brain. You know, non-REM slow of activity measures brain waves, EEG in the brain. It's not only a brain driven process, we're measuring the results of that process in the brain. And this skeletal muscle mutation was clearly having effects on not only sleep regulatory mechanisms in the brain, but also our diagnostic analysis of that using EEG. Um, so we showed that um, BMO1 rescue in the, in the muscle was sufficient to make these knockout mice sleep like wild types. Sufficiency is one half to determine whether a, mo a molecule, a molecule is, is critical for behavior. Now we wanted to find out whether it was necessary. And in order to do that, we got mice from Karen Esser. At, at, at the time, she's at University of Kentucky. Now she's at University of Florida that knocked out BMO1 and otherwise healthy mice, specifically in the skeletal muscle. We knew our phenotype was in the skeletal muscle. So we did the knockout mice, uh, mu selective muscle specific knockouts. These studies were done by Allison Brager. Um, she found that if you knocked out BMO1 selective in the skeletal muscle, the mice slept more. This is non-REM sleep over on the left, the graph that I'm gonna draw your attention to, slept like whole body knockouts, showing that BMO1 was both necessary and sufficient for normal sleep in these mice. And it was BMO1 in skeletal muscle. It is BMO1 in skeletal muscle which is still relatively surprising to us. Well, why would BMO1 and skeletal muscle be influenced of sleep? We're still trying to answer that question. Allison did another series of experiments where she put the mice on treadmills and looked at their responses to a variety of exercises. And she found a, a variety of different phenotypes which she record, reported in 2017, it's been a while now. One of them was that these mice have lower energy expenditure in, in um, I'm sorry, that, take that back. These are in BMO1 muscle overexpression mice. So this slide is coming a little bit early. So in knockout, she found out that she, that they, that they slept like, uh, that the uh, muscle specific knockouts slept like whole body knockouts. She overexpressed BMO1 in skeletal muscle and in a slide, I'm going to tell you why that's such a valuable model. And she found that overexpressing BMO1 actually lowered energy expenditure in those mice. So I showed you that uh, selective knockout of BMO1 and skeletal muscle increases non-REM sleep amount. Selective knockout reduces uh, recovery from sleep loss. BMO1 expression of skeletal muscle is necessary for proper functioning of sleep regulatory processes in the brain. But what about overexpression of BMO1 in skeletal muscle? And I just showed you one slide showing that overexpression has an effect on energy expenditure. Well, um, when we did our knockout mice are sterile. The only way to do our rescues were in head crosses, very expensive. But one of the values of those head crosses is that they produce a knockout that expresses the transgene and they produce a wild type that expresses the transgene. And when you have a wild type that expresses the muscle and brain mutation, it overexpresses BMO1. You have the endogenous BMO1 and then you have the transgenic exogenous BMO1 that creates an overexpression model where you overexpress BMO1 in the muscle in the brain. But why is that valuable? That's valuable because when you delete BMO1, even muscle specific, you're doing two things. You're deleting the gene and you're breaking the clock. So even in the muscle specific uh, knockout, when you knock it out, there's no longer a clock in the skeletal muscle. So you really don't know if the phenotype you're looking at is a result of this gene not working or the clock not working. You overexpress BMO1, you ramp up the levels, you change the levels of BMO1, you alter the gene and its expression and the protein. But the clock still works fine. There are no negative aspects of the clock. The clock still keeps accurate time. The amplitude and the period of the clock are the same. So because we had these, uh, these, these overexpression mice in the litters and because they asked, allowed us to answer questions about BMO1 that the knockouts did not, we did the same set of experiments with the overexpression. Now we did a bunch of experiments prior to this one. For time's sake, I didn't include those. I included this one because this was our, our most exciting result in overexpression. This is a 72 hour experiment with 24 hours of baseline and a 12 hour light, 12 hour dark cycle, 24 hours of sleep restriction and the slowly rotating wheel because I'm not persuasive enough to convince undergraduates to tap cages for 24 hours. I can get them to do it for six hours. 24 hours is above outside of my, uh, my range of per persuasiveness. And then we allow the mice to recover for the last 24 hours 
dash bar indicates the time the mice were in a slowly rotating wheel. As I said, trying to audit, sleep. We're going to sleep, guys. You're going to sleep. You can, you can, somebody can try to keep you awake for days at a time, and you're going to find ways to sleep. These mice, if you put them in a wheel that just rotates on its own, the mice will stay awake for a while. Then they'll get micro sleeps. They'll figure out how to sleep in short periods of time. Or they run up to one side of the wheel and then ride it until they get micro sleep. And then when they get to a point that they can't ride anymore, they'll wake up and run back. And so that's what you're seeing here in the uh, in the 24 hours. You're seeing these micro sleeps, these these not there, parts of non-REM sleep. As you can see, they're able to get more of it as the sleep deprivation continues. And there's still a rhythm. Um, the first thing we found was that in red, our mice that overexpressed BMO1 appeared to be awake more during the sleep deprivation procedure. And when we quantified that, we indeed found that mice that overexpressed BMO1 were, were easier to keep awake. Um, then during recovery, it doesn't look like it's much difference between the two, but then when you take into account that the mice that overexpressed BMO1 lost a lot more sleep than the wild types, when we looked at non-REM sleep recovery as the percentage of sleep gained during recovery, over uh, as the sleep gain during recovery as a percentage of sleep lost, um, we found out that the mice that overexpressed BMO1 recovered half the amount of sleep as wild types, suggesting to us that not only are these mice easier to keep awake, that they may be resistant to sleep loss. When we looked at their delta power over the duration of the experiment, we found out throughout the duration of the experiment, the mice that overexpressed BMO1 had lower delta power suggesting again that they are resistant to sleep loss indeed. Um, they have lower basal sleep pressure. They're just not as sleepy, generally speaking, as the wild types. But this was a result that um, kind of raised our interest because over the, so like I said, the limitation of non-REM delta power is that you can't measure during wakefulness because there are no delta waves during wakefulness. Most of the EEG during wakefulness are comprised of higher frequency waves. You have very limited delta waves, however, if you sleep deprive a mouse more than six hours or a human, if you sleep deprive a human or a mouse, that's what we consider more stringent, longer levels of sleep deprivation, then you'll see leakage of slow waves into the waking EEG. And if you get enough slow wave le leakage into the waking EEG, then you can use non-REM slow wave activity to measure process S during wakefulness. And when we did that, we found out that our BMO muscle overexpression had a lot more slow waves during their waking, uh, during sleep deprivation and their waking EEG. This is delta power during wakefulness, suggesting to us that not only were these mice relatively resistant to sleep loss, but that they also um, may be uh, dissipating sleep pressure during sleep loss, during wakefulness, which is not what we normally see during wakefulness. Like I said earlier, your sleep pressure builds because we had more slow wave leakage into the EEG, suggesting, that suggests to us that these mice somehow have a mechanism where they're able to dissipate sleep pressure during wakefulness. There are examples of a biological process through which this can happen. Anyone that's aware of local sleep, the local sleep phenomenon first reported by Chiara Cirelli at University of Wisconsin, that there are discrete brain areas that can go offline and go to sleep even though you're showing behavioral wakefulness. We think that may be what's underlying um, the increased slow wave uh, activity that we're seeing during wakefulness. And this is hot off the press. This stuff that has not been published that we're working on right now. The graphs I'm showing you right now were done by Alexis Tucker, who's a master's student in the lab. We felt that if these guys were resistant to sleep loss, let's see if they're resistant to some of the behavioral deficits associated with sleep loss. Because time is short, I'm going to show you the one that uh, we got really uh, positive results on. That was a novel object test uh, of, of recognition memory performed um, after 12 hours of sleep loss without going into the details of the test itself because my time is short. I will show you that wild type mice, um, uh, this is sleep replete and sleep deprived mice. Um, novel object recognition is a test of memory, of, of uh, recognition memory. And after sleep deprivation, the wild type mice performed worse. They spent less time um, with the novel object suggesting that the sleep deprivation had the predicted effect on memory. Um, however, in mice that overexpressed B11 in the skeletal muscle, um, they performed better. Not only was there no deficits in uh, memory recognition after 12 hours of sleep loss, um, they actually performed better uh, after sleep deprivation, which we're still trying to figure out how that happened. 
And this data on the right are, are recapitulates the same data on the left, showing the individual uh, wild type mice and BMO1 um, uh, muscle overexpression mice. Not only did they perform uh, better on a novel object test, but Alexis uh, actually measured using a Western blot, the amount of BMO1 in the skeletal muscle, the levels of BMO1 in the skeletal muscle, the black dots are wild types. These red, like I said, it's hot off the press, so we still, our sample size is still relatively low. These red dots are mice that overexpress BMO1. As you can see, there tends to be variability. These, these uh, uh, levels were measured in gastrocnemius muscle and mice, and she found a significant correlation between time spent um, exploring a novel objects and the levels of BMO1 protein expressed in the gastroc muscle. Um, the R value is 0.68 and it is significant, suggesting to us that their ability to perform on a novel object test is indeed associated with BMO1 levels in the skeletal muscle. This was data um, uh, done through a collaboration with Joe Bass at Northwestern University that shows when we looked at um, so there's a bunch of questions like, all right, why would skeletal muscle be influencing sleep? What's happening at the muscle? What's happening in the brain? And what's the signal? And I have a separate talk for each three of those. <laughs> but uh, for this talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the skeletal muscle. Most of our research in the biochemistry paper that Dr. Breger published in um, 2017 suggests that that the ability of the muscle mutation to influence sleep is occurring through some sort of metabolic feedback between the brain and the skeletal muscle, that it's energy metabolism, and the, that the two tissues are signaling um, uh, information about energy metabolism between the two. What we do know is that in skeletal muscle of mice that overexpress BMO1, that the ratio of adenosine, uh, AMP, uh, adenosine monophosphate over adenosine triphosphate is a lot higher in the mitochondria of mice that overexpress BMO1. Um, we found a couple of other mitochondrial phenotypes, and since then, several other labs have published that BMO1 uh, manipulation has a, 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 a robust and immediate effects on energy metabolism in mitochondria, and many of those are mediated by the gene PGC1-alpha. So that's what we're looking at right now. This is a graph in the middle of PGC1-alpha which we keep consistent with, we've gotten these levels of BMO1 overexpression, which are higher than wild type, but not significantly so. As you can see, we've got stars over BMO1, BMO1 significantly higher. Um, we think there's something there with PGC1-alpha. Um, we're doing uh, much more comprehensive experiments with that. This uh, sample of this skeletal muscle was taken as ZT15. So we recognize that the timing that we're looking at uh, these, these uh, molecules may have an impact. And we're also interested in BDNF. This one is also uh, 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 a trend toward a difference in BDNF in skeletal muscle. This is all of these are in skeletal muscle, not significant, but we have a lot of evidence to suggest that BDNF may be involved in the signal. There also have been papers that show that BMO1 not only um, has effects on mitochondria and skeletal muscle and other tissues through PGC1 alpha, but may influence BDNF. So right now we're actively going after the signal. These are some of the candidates that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of going after in the lab right now. Um, so from the talk I gave you today, I've shown you the BMO1 rescue and skeletal muscle restores sleep phenotypes and BMO1 knockout mice. Selective knockout of BMO1 and skeletal muscle reduces recovery from sleep loss and increases slow wave activity. BMO1 overexpression of skeletal muscle reduces recovery from sleep loss and reduces slow wave activity. Um, and appears to make mice resistant to sleep loss. These mice that overexpress BMO1 have healthy clocks that don't seem to have many of the negative effects of sleep loss, including the uh, slow wave activity in the memory. And that BMO1 and skeletal muscle, and, uh, overexpressing skeletal muscle improves performance on, memory, on a memory associated task while on sleep loss. And I want to acknowledge all of those who contributed to the work. Much of the sleep work was done at, when I was still at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, much of the work that I showed you in, in the preliminary data, uh, all of the work in preliminary data, and some of the uh, other work I've shown you, some of the published work actually was done here um, after I got to UCLA in 2016. Um, Chris Aylin and Allison Breger did most of the sleep experiments in the lab. The mice were generated by Karen Esser and Joe Takahashi. Um, and everyone else on the slide has contributed um, greatly to the work that I showed you today. I, I, I'd like to thank you and open the floor for questions.
And then this one works. This one seems to work. Uh, hi, uh, really fascinating talk. Um, the skeletal stuff is, is um, mysterious and fascinating. Um, I have a question. In Parkinson's disease, um, non-REM sleep disorder is a very prominent feature. Sometimes it's a really extreme problem. And so I'm thinking about Parkinson's as movement disorder and something that is obviously gonna affect skeletal muscle activity and wondering if you have any evidence linking Parkinson's disease to uh, this gene or to, um, or to skeletal muscle uh, function that might explain why a non-REM sleep is so prominent. So the answer to your question is no, I'm not aware of any studies that specifically link BMOL 1 to the sleep impairments associated with Parkinson's or any of the other clot genes. However, for many neurological disorders, and I'm pretty sure Parkinson's is one of them, many of the therapies are now targeting sleep, particularly during development, to see if um, improving sleep during development may mitigate some of the negative phenotypes associated with Parkinson's and other disorders during adulthood, one of the uh, kind of underlying uh, premises or hypotheses is that if children are developing, uh, people developing that, or people that are at risk, I should say people at risk for Parkinson's, because Parkinson's is a disorder that usually develops a little later, um, people that are at risk for neurological disorders, if they sleep better when they're developing, that, that mitigates the risk later in life or mitigates some of the simple symptoms later in life. Some of the underlying hypotheses or premises involve consolidating, better consolidating of sleep-wake states, and that involves a circadian clock, but I'm not aware of any evidence that the genes themselves are involved in those diseases. There may be some, I'm just not aware. I hope I answered your question. So sleep itself and sleep consolidation is, is important, especially during development for, um, for uh, appears to be important, I should say, for the risk of these disorders and some of the, um, the impairments associated with them, but not too sure about clock. Now, I do know of reports for aut autism spectrum disorder that circadian-based um, illnesses seem to be associated with the, uh, this was done out of Wufeng Powell's lab, I can't remember where he is right now, that those uh, impairments are associated with um, developing um, un, uh, impairments associated with autism spectrum disorder, but I'm not too sure about Parkinson's. Hi, Katima. Very I, my question is about anxiety. Have you looked at anxiety phenotypes of any of these? Uh, your your question, my question, and so many others. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Anxiety is the most common um, uh, kind of uh, 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 phenomenon associated with insomnia was associated with a variety of sleep disorders. And then one of the big questions, you know, there's this idea of allostasis. One of the big questions in the field right now is to what degree is sleep loss causing anxiety and to what degree is sleep loss associated with stress and that stress and the potential anxiety that may result from it may kind of uh, reset the, the homeostatic set point. Um, don't have a lot of evidence behind that, um, we're, but I will say we're really interested. We're doing experiments right now to find out whether the mutation in the skeletal muscle has any effects on stress and anxiety. As you can uh, imagine, uh, stress and anxiety tends to be pretty difficult to study in, in, um, in the kind of paradigms that we're using in which we're doing sleep experiments, which have to be really, really well controlled. Also, our measures of stress itself, now I'm moving away from anxiety, talking about stress are really rudimentary in my very humble opinion. We measure glucocorticoids and on a good day, maybe some catecholamines. And what we're finding is those may be, you know, okay to, to look at, you know, when you're looking at stress and behavior, but when you're looking at sleep, you know, the intersection between stress, sleep and behavior, that our traditional measures of stress responses just are not sufficient. Um, so the answer to your question, Chris, is for this, I'm not sure the role that anxiety plays. I think generally speaking, we're still really far behind in understanding the role that stress response mechanisms play in sleep homeostasis. I think the two process model suggests that the homeostatic mechanism is completely removed from what we consider normal stress response mechanisms and, and mechanisms responsible for anxiety. But I think the data is, is, is still equivocal on that. I don't think there's any consensus. I think, and, I, and, and if you ask me in my personal opinion, I do think stress response mechanisms and potentially anxiety may be involved in some of the effects we're seeing on sleep homeostasis. Too early to tell on this model. I hope I answered your question. 
Right, so there's um, some questions from the, um, from the remote audience um, about BMOL expression. Okay. Um, and I guess specifically probably in muscle, um, but, but does it change with aging? And is, it, is there anything we can do to increase our BMOL levels yeah. in, the, in the muscle? Yeah, so when we, higher levels? when we published this, we were hoping we could find a way to actually act on BMOL1 exogenously other than having to insert a transgene. And we're still working on that. BMO1 levels don't necessarily change with age, but amplitude of circadian rhythm can be influenced by age. We don't necessarily know if BMO1, BMO1 underlies that. Now, uh, BMO1 is expressed much more robustly in brain and skeletal muscle, but it's expressed in the majority of tissues throughout the body. So when you're asking questions about, B, and, and the answer to your question, you're asking questions about BMO1 and physiology. BMO1 tends to be, BMO1 does the same thing as far as controlling the clock, but these clock genes are transcription factors. They don't just act on other clock genes, they act on clock control genes. So the way that these genes regulate all of the circadian rhythms is to act on genes that are responsible for the behaviors that they regulate. They're called clock control genes. The clock control genes that are activated by BMO1 tend to be tissue specific and, to, and those to my understanding can be influenced by age. The, 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 so the work that BMO does can change with aging. And it depends on the specific tissue that you're looking at, specifically in the liver. So even though I'm not sure the BMO1 levels change with age, the um, specific roles that BMO1 plays in regulating your, uh, your circadian rhythms, particularly the clock controlled genes that they either upregulate or suppress um, can be influenced by age. I guess this is a final question then. Um, is in these studies on BMO in the, in the, in the muscle, is do you have any insights into how you could help support um, patients in terms of their sleep? There's, been, there's several questions. Well, initially we were hoping to develop the skeletal muscle as a, as a target perhaps to try to help treat sleep disorders. That's the, that was the whole goal of this and it still is the goal of this. Um, our ability to do that is gonna depend on, on you know, the extent to which we can find a signal. So to date, we have not uh, come up with really promising uh, therapies for sleep wake disorders. Uh, that's one of our goals, and we're working with uh, clinical groups here at, at UCLA right now to move in that direction. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so I showed you earlier that these mice have lower energy expenditure. We've got mice on wheels upstairs right now running um, on double time on the wheels. I hate to blame the pandemic, but we couldn't do that for about two years. So now that we're back, uh, we, we are doing those experiments right now. We do know the chronic partial sleep deprivation. We've done, um, so we've done a whole lot of experiments that I haven't shown you. And we did one with chronic partial sleep deprivation, which does involve heavier activity. And these mice are also resistant to, in their abilities to recover from that. I actually have a slide a presentation on that. Right now we're double time. we actually had to get that approved by IACUC, as you can imagine, on the protocol. <laughs> that took a little while, but we're, we're looking at that right now. <laughs> All right, with that, um, let's uh, thank Dr. Paul and um, thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, thank you for having me.